So one of the most chilling episodes of Star Trek never gets the respect it's due. I have it as a top 10 episode of the original uh, series. A uh, lot of uh, chills, a lot of cerebral uh, strength, uh, Shakespearean literally in many ways. Uh, and the ending is one of the best in Star Trek history. This is called The Conscience of the King. Now, uh, it's the 13th episode of the first season of Star Trek, written by Barry Trivers and directed by Jared Oswald. It first aired on December 8th, 1966. The episode takes the title from the concluding lines of Act 2 of Hamlet, the play is the thing wherein I'll catch the conscience of the king. In the episode, Captain Kirk crosses path with an actor suspected of having been a mass-murdering dictator some 20 years earlier. Now, uh, the Arnold Moss uh, performance as Anton Caridian or possibly Kodos is one of the best in Star Trek history and does get enough respect. Because he has to make it believable that he's uh, literally a, a serial killer with uh, Hitler-type ambitions. Now, this one, the USS Enterprise is called to Planet Q by Dr. Thomas Layton, a friend of Captain Kirk's, ostensibly to investigate a possible new synthetic food source. Layton's uh, true motivation, however, is the suspicion that Anton Caridian, the leader of a Shakespearean acting troupe currently on the planet performing Macbeth, is in fact, Kodos, the executioner, former governor of the York colony of Tarsus IV. Kodos had ordered that half the population of 8,000 be put to death during a food shortage as supply ships were late and it was believed the full population would not survive until they arrived. Both Leighton and Kirk were eyewitnesses. Kirk insists Kodos is dead, but reconsiders after researching Caridian's background. Hoping to meet Caridian at a party in Leighton's home, Kirk meets his daughter Lenore, and during a walk outside, the two find Lighten dead. Kind of ironic, he's portrayed uh, Lighten as a man with the, the total, I think it was the left side of his body, covered by a huge bee like bandage. Very good special effects. Now, Kirk arranges for the Enterprise to ferry the acting troop to its next destination. He transfers Lieutenant Kevin Riley to engineering after discovering that he too was a witness to the Tarsus IV massacre. These actions abuse the curiosity of First Officer Spock who, after an investigation of his own, learns the history of the massacre, Kirk and Riley's connection to it, and that seven of the nine witnesses of the massacre have died, in each case when Caridian's troop was somewhere nearby. A very, very Sherlock Holmesian film noir plot as it goes along. Riley is eventually poisoned, and a phaser set on overload is left in Kirk's quarters. Kirk confronts Caridian with suspicions. Caridian does not admit to being Kodos, but argues in defense of Kodos's actions, and when asked to read a transcript of Kodos's execution order, does so with barely a glance at the paper. A computer analyst of the voice results as a near-perfect match with Kodos, but Kirk still hesitates to accuse Caridian. At this time, Caridian said, Yes, I am Kodos, if it pleases you, but we all know you can see between the lines. Now, Riley, recovering sickbay, overhears Dr. McCoy's log entry and learns that Caridian suspected being Kodos. Riley heads for the ship's theater, where the troop is performing Hamlet, and goes backstage, phaser in hand, to exact a revenge for the death of his family. Kirk discovers him before he can act, and persuades him to surrender the weapon. Caridian, uh, overhearing, is disturbed, and Lenore tries to reassure him by revealing that she has been killing the witnesses to his crimes. And Caridian basically tells her, what have you done? You've ruined me. You've taken on my pain. Kirk, overhearing this conversation, moves to arrest them both. Lenore snatches a phaser from security guard and aims at Kirk. Caridian eventually jumps in the line of fire, is hit, and dies. Lenore breaks down and begs her father to wake up and continue his performance. Later on the bridge, McCoy reports on her psychiatric condition. She believes her father is still alive and giving performances to cheering crowds. See, what makes the episode totally chilling is because Shakespeare, as performed at Stratford, where Shatner pretty well got his first start, they perfected it, and Shatner uh, does Shakespeare, or what do you call it, the cousin of Shakespeare, so effortlessly, everything is believable, including uh, Spock's breakdown of what Caridian did as well. It's uh, quite a cold way to describe a despot like Hitler, Ceausescu, all the bad ones of the years. Now, the episode featured the final appearance of production order Grace Lee Whitney, Yeoman Janice Rand. Whitney had already been notified she was fired from the series a week before Fleming on uh, his episode began. A brief walk-on scene in which she gives a dirty look to her rival blonde, Lenore Caridian, arriving on the bridge, 
was her last scene in Star Trek before returning 13 years later in Star Trek The Motion Picture. Now, we still don't know why she was fired. There was something about it, uh, she was abused on set, and that led to her firing. Let the lawyers decide that. The episode was the second and final appearance of Lieutenant Kevin Riley, portrayed played by Bruce Hyde, who first appeared in Naked Time. It should have appeared uh, quite a bit often after that. It was just tremendous. All first season core Star Trek regular background players appear in the episode, including Eddie Paskey, Lieutenant Leslie, Frank Da Vinci, Lieutenant Brett, William Blackburn, Lieutenant Hadley, Ron Vito, Harrison, and Gene Malone, Enterprise Yeoman. The ship's theaters are redress of the engineering set. Set pieces of the ship's gym, first seen in the episode Charlie X, are hanging on the walls, and the ceiling of the set is visible in some of the shooting angles. Now, star of the Adams family, John Aston provide the voice of the unseen Captain John Daly, though he went uncredited. Now, in 2013, Wired ranked this episode one of the top ten episodes of the original TV series. Zach Hanlon of the AV Club gave the episode an A-minus rating, noting strong performances from the actors, including a great Spock-McCoy dynamic and some very credible acting from Shatner. Keith DeCandido, writing for Tor.com, commended the act of Ma, Shatner, and Anderson, but felt that the episode had aged poorly in regard to only be able to identify Caridian as Kodos via an unreliable voice comparison. Well, this is 1966 using, you know, future perfection. It's not, there's, it's not going to age well. He gave the episode a rating of seven. Jamal Epsi Kokan of Jammers Reviews rated the episode two and a half out of four and similarly praised the performance of Moss and Anderson, but criticized the ending, calling it inappropriate. That's the only way that the show would end. Now, Michelle Erica Green of Trek Today also praised Moss and Anderson's performances, but criticized the episode script. Later, Star Trek writer Ronald B. Moore considered the episodes to be deeply underrated and one of the series' best. When I say go underrated, you look at this, how it plays out. It starts off as a stage play where a key character is uh, murdered. And it ties into Caridian. It ties into it, when he stabs Duncan, or a guy playing Duncan, is he harkening back to when he murdered all these people? But how people would work, uh, Paul Pot, uh, you know, uh, Stalin... You know, all the different, uh, you know, what happened in Serbia. A decision to live or die goes to a person's head. That's what Hitler did. Hitler threw thousands of young people to their deaths in uh, 45 from January to the end of the war where there was no hope of winning. So, I mean, but the, the uh, Caridian, my God, what a what a interesting character. As, as, as evil as anybody could be, but like, you know, lost. Now... Arnold Moss, uh, as we as we noted, is the key to this episode. Everything he does is quite interesting. Now, a lot of people felt he was typecast from this uh, episode. He basically uh, wasn't someone that a lot of people uh, knew, but a lot of people knew after this episode. There's no there's no way that uh, uh, Moss could have could have not played the part even better. Now. What happened with him? He is uh, kind of TV excellence kind of faded out after uh, Star Trek, but he was on a lot of uh, interesting show. And I think one of the most interesting movies he was in was a movie called uh, Quebec. It was a fictional account of the Patriots' Rebellion. Very, very interesting movie that's been kind of lost, like John Barrymore Jr. is in that as well. But what I really like about him, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for a guy from Brooklyn, New York, he could play any type of country. He was a tremendous actor. So, ladies and gentlemen, if you like what you're doing with our Star Trek podcast, let us know with a like, comment, subscribe, or share. And don't forget, phasers on stun. Bye. <laughs>